Haggai chapter 1 verse 7 through 9. This is what the Lord Almighty says. Give careful thought as your, to your ways. Go up into the mountains and bring down timber. And build the house so that I may take pleasure in it and be honored, says the Lord. You expected much, but see it turned out to be little. What you brought home I blew away. Why? declares the Lord Almighty. Because of my house, which remains a ruin, while each of you is busy with his own house. All right, we've been working our way through the minor prophets, those last books of the Old Testament that we don't read all that often. And uh, we see right from the very first verse of the first chapter that the prophet Haggai makes it easy for us to be able to date his work. He tells us that he begins his writing in the second year of King Darius on the first day of the sixth month. Uh, this would then we know to be the year 520 B.C., and he addresses his words to the governor of Judah, which would be Zerubbabel, no longer called them king, but, but governor, and then the high priest as, as well. So what this means is that it's been 70 to 80 years since the last of the minor prophets. And in those 70 to 80 years, a lot happened. Three times the Babylonians had invaded Judah and each time gaining more and more control until they finally conquered Jerusalem in 586 BC. So that means that the beautiful temple of Solomon was utterly destroyed. The Jews were exiled from their homeland, the land that had been promised to them by God centuries before. And for 50 years they were literally held hostage in a foreign land. Now there have been many dark times in the history of, of Israel and certainly none more dark than the Holocaust in the last century but this period of exile has to rank near the very darkest but yet it should not have been a surprise God had warned them that it would happen and it did but this judgment of God against his people was not the end of them and uh, even though many of them might have thought that it was but in the 530s BC the Medes and the Persians had joined together and they defeated Babylon. And so the king of Persia, who was Cyrus, became a hero to the Jews because he issued an edict in 536 BC which allowed for the Jews to return to their homeland. And Cyrus even provided the finances for them to rebuild the temple when they got there. And so about 50,000 Jews returned to Judah. That was less than half in what were originally exiled, but there's still a rather large group. And so they immediately began the work on the rebuilding of the temple. The foundations of the temple were laid in a very short time, and things were going very well. They knew that it was important for the temple to be rebuilt. It was a symbol of their heritage and of their faith. And if they were going to reestablish themselves as a nation, it was very crucial for this iconic structure to be rebuilt. Well then, sort of out of the blue, their work on the temple stopped. It just halted after the foundation was built. Evidently, for personal and for political reasons, they just didn't have the burning desire to complete the work. They started working on building their own homes and establishing their own farms and, and protecting their own property. Well, one thing that the Jews discovered when they returned from exile was that they had a new rival. Uh, the book of Ezra completes the story and relates the complications that were caused by this new rival. See, their neighbors to the north were made up of Assyrians who had been conquered by the Babylonians and also the Jews who had lived in the northern kingdom of Israel who were conquered by the Assyrians and then also the Babylonians. And so these people then had intermingled and they created literally a whole new race of people who came to be called Samaritans. Sound, sound familiar from the New Testament? Lots of things told us about the Samaritans. Well, here back in the 500s BC, the Samaritans had wanted to help with the rebuilding of the temple. But the Jews said, no way. They didn't look at the Samaritans as true Jews because they had intermingled with other races. Now, whether they were right in refusing their help, I don't know, but maybe not. But at any rate, their refusal created a bitter rivalry between the Jews and the Samaritans that just kept growing and growing. And they became like the, the team up north that we're not talking about this weekend. But <laughs> <laughs> Centuries later, though, Jesus acknowledged this rivalry that had developed over years and years of time and, and that famous Good Samaritan story. And so remotely, this, this rivalry even consists today. So now, the Jews had something else to think about and to worry about besides the rebuilding of the temple. 
they felt that they had to protect their land and their property from their new enemies. They felt they had to put their own homes and their own farms ahead of the house of the Lord. And so the rebuilding of the temple came to a halt. I'm sure they intended to complete it someday, but they didn't do a thing about it for 16 years. The foundation just sat there. Might have been like a typical American church business meeting where somebody says, you know, we did say we were going to do that, didn't we? You know, we'll have to get on that one of these days. And still the, the work goes undone. And it really does speak to our generation because we are such a narcissistic generation. Now, that's a term that's used often in psychology and everything, but you probably know it. I mean, we take after a narcissist, the, the Greek mythological character who, who fell in love with his own reflection and how that describes us in so many ways today. So much of what we do as a society just centers on our own selfish pursuits because all we think about is self, self-improvement, self-fulfillment, self-esteem, self-gratification, our own personal rights, looking after me. And social media just seems to capture this in so many ways. If you know me, I just rant and rant about social media and get tired of hearing about it. And there's nothing wrong with social media in and of itself. It's a great idea. But what it's become is just such a, a self-centered thing where people look at it, this is, this is a way to get attention on me. Okay, every, okay, world, pay attention to me. Listen to what I'm going to tweet here or what I'm going to post. And it just seems a, a focus on, on paying attention to myself and my, my rights, my entitlement. Now, I'm not against human rights. Our Declaration of Independence and the Constitution of our country define them and promote them, and I'm all for that. But see, when, when our personal rights become the most important thing to us, when, when attention on me becomes the most important thing, then it's so easy for us as Christians to lose sight of our calling from God. And in the name of personal rights and personal attention, great sin is being perpetrated. There are millions of abortions each year because people are worried about their rights more than they are about right and wrong. Divorce is so commonplace because so many people put their own well-being first because they think they have that right no matter what it does to the institution of the family and to the hearts of little children. Now I know in many cases there are people who tried their hardest and did all that they can and divorce was just simply no option for them. I understand that. But I also understand that for many, there were many other options besides just giving up and not hanging in there. There's so much said today and so much argument about homosexual rights. And, and, and the whole point gets lost that homosexuality is a sin. Yes, you have rights. People have rights. You have the governmental right to sin if you want to. But sin is still sin. And there's so many other examples about how our self-centeredness violates the very laws of God. And one of the most glaring examples I often see is the whole area of unforgiveness. People believe that they have a right to hold a grudge against someone and to be bitter because of something that, that's been done to them. And frankly, they do have that right. You have that right to feel that way, absolutely. But you lose so much more than you gain by hanging on to that right. If we would become God-centered, we would view all of these issues in a more spiritual realm and not in reference to our own personal rights. Again, I'm not diminishing the fact that uh, we have rights as Americans and as human beings, but just remember the words of Jesus when he said, we need not fear him who can kill the body, but rather who can kill the body and the soul. Instead of worrying about our rights, we should be worried about our souls. If we can take care of, of serving God first, then the rights that God has endowed us with will not be violated. Again, as Jesus said, seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things will be added to you. So the Jews stopped building the temple so that they could look out for their own selfish interests. You would think that after all that they had been through that they would have learned to just obey the Lord and to trust in him. But they're just like we all are. We haven't learned that. There, there's a new lesson every day in our lives about that for us. So 16 years had passed since they, the, the foundation had been built and nothing else had been done. And this is when Haggai steps in. And he brings them the word of the Lord. And he spoke to the people four different times within a period of four months in that same year. And the first time, as we read, was on the first day of the sixth month, which would have been 520 B.C. And as you might have guessed, there was a word of rebuke to the people for not completing the work on the temple. As chapter 1, verse 2 says, This is what the Lord Almighty says. These people say, The time has not yet come for the Lord's house to be built. Then the word of the Lord came through the prophet Haggai. 
Is it a time for you yourselves to be living in your paneled houses while this house remains a ruin? Now this is what the Lord Almighty says. Give careful thought to your ways. You have planted much but have harvested little. You eat but never have enough. You drink but never have your fill. You put on clothes but are not warm. You earn wages only to put them in a purse with holes in it. This is what the Lord Almighty says. Give careful thought to your ways. Go up into the mountains and bring down timber and build the house so that I may take pleasure in it and be honored, says the Lord. God talks to them about the stewardship of their time. For the Jews didn't have time to rebuild the house of the Lord, but they did have time for their own houses and their own lands. And God tells them they got it backwards. Verse 9 says, You expected much, but see, it turned out to be little. What you brought home, I blew away. Why, declares the Lord Almighty? Because of my house, which remains a ruin, while each of you is busy with his own house. Therefore, because of you, the heavens have withheld their dew, and the earth its crops. I call for a drought on the fields and the mountains, on the grain, the new wine, the oil, and whatever the ground produces, on men and cattle, and on the labor of your hands. God wanted them to see that there was a definite connection between their spiritual failure and their economic failure. There's a novel thought, isn't there? (laughs) As we complain daily about our inflation and our stock market and all the financial difficulties our country's going through, is it possible that there's a connection between our spiritual failure and our economic failure? I guess that remains to be seen, but for the Jews, there was no doubt about that. That's what God was telling them. They're spending all their time and their resources on themselves, and God wanted them to see that he could just wipe that all out in a minute. But if they would just give God the first of their time and their resources, he would make sure their other needs were taken care of. That, that's a thought and a principle that is found throughout all Scripture. But we never seem to quite get it. We always seem to worry about ourselves first. We see this in our country, in many of our churches, and in many of our individual lives. Put God first, and your lives will be better. Give to God first, and he will take care of the rest of your financial needs. There's an equation that you can take home with you. God first, yourself next, that equals a better life. An equation that never fails. Well, the people did seem to get the point, and they went back to work on the temple because of Haggai's influence over them. Then on the 21st day of the next month, the word of the Lord comes again to Haggai. Only this time it was a word of encouragement. Chapter 2, verse 4 says, But now be strong, O Zerubbabel, declares the Lord. Be strong, O Joshua, son of Jehozadak, the high priest. Be strong, all you people of the land, declares the Lord, and work. For I am with you, declares the Lord Almighty. This is what I covenanted with you when you came out of Egypt, and my spirit remains among you. Do not fear. The Lord was encouraging them. Keep building. You're doing great. I know it's hard, but keep up the good work. And just as much as the people needed to be rebuked by the Lord, they also needed his encouragement. And so he reminded them of the covenant that he made with them so many years ago. As your pastor, I am called sometimes to bring you the rebuke of the Lord, as I myself also need to be rebuked. But more than anything else, I want to bring you encouragement in the Lord. Now, we're doing some great things for God here in our church. Let's keep it up. I know it's hard, but don't get discouraged. Keep building. The Lord is with us, and that's all we need to know. Don't give up. He will bless our efforts. And it's good to know that God is cheering us on as he is true to his part of his covenant with us. Well, the word of the Lord came to Haggai a third time on the 24th day of the ninth month, or over two months later. And this time it was a word of reminder. He was reminding the people about the meaning of the temple. They were really getting caught up in the work now, although they were far from being finished. But they were working hard, and it seems that God wanted to make sure that they understood why the temple needed to be rebuilt. In verse 11 of chapter 2, it says, This is what the Lord Almighty says. Ask the priests what the law says. If a person carries consecrated meat in the fold of his garment, and that fold touches some bread or stew, some wine, oil, or other food, does it become consecrated? The priest answered, no. Then Haggai said, if a person defiled by contact with a dead body touches one of these things, does it become defiled? Yes, the priest replied, it becomes defiled. 
Then Haggai said, So it is with this people and this nation in my sight, declares the Lord. Whatever they do and whatever they offer there is defiled. Now give careful thought to this from this day on. Consider how things were before one stone was laid on another in the Lord's temple. He wanted them to understand that it wasn't itself that was so important, but rather what it symbolized. It symbolized that covenant relationship between God and his people. Rebuilding the temple meant nothing if that covenant did not exist. The temple was really all about God and, and his people. So just envision that site of the old temple, which was laid in ruins for all those years. It was called an abomination of desolation because those ruins symbolized the covenant of the Hebrew God had been broken at least for a while. And everyone who looked upon those ruins could see that and know that, and that was indeed tragic. There wasn't anything the Jews could do about that part. The damage was done. But once they were freed, and they came back, and they only laid the foundation of the temple, and then they quit, envision that site, and what that told the people who looked upon that site. There was definitely a message there. I've seen, perhaps you've seen too, a, a building project get started and then see that, that no progress has been made for a long time. And that, that sends a message to all who, who see that. We may not know exactly why the building stopped, but everybody sees that site and knows that there's some sort of problem. Perhaps the builders ran out of money, or perhaps uh, there, were, there was a worker strike, or maybe there was a, a building permit problem or something. But when the work stops, you know there's a reason for it. But when the Jews had stopped their work on the temple, it said loud and clear that they did not hold their God in very high esteem and that they looked upon their faith as something that, that could wait for a more convenient time. And what a poor testimony that was. Contrast that to the pagan temples of that ancient time that were gloriously built. People worshipped false gods, but they held those gods in high esteem more so than the Jews loved the one true God. And that's why the temple had to be rebuilt, to repair the testimony that had been so badly damaged. Now that the work of the temple had resumed and it was going well, God was reinforcing that it was not the building itself that was so important, but rather the covenant that it symbolized. If the Jews did not remain a holy people unto God, that building meant nothing. What went, in, what went on inside their hearts was much more important than what went on inside the building. And God was reiterating the message that was told by the prophets throughout the ages, that to obey was better than sacrifice, that that holiness was not spread through the outward appearances and, and rituals, but rather through the attitude of the heart. And that spiritual defilement can be spread through that wrong attitude, just like physical defilement can be spread through contact with unclean things. And the application fits easily to us today. We need to be equally careful that our outward testimony is one that tells people that we love the Lord and that we hold Him in high esteem. There's so many ways for us to do that, such as having an attractive building in which to worship, which we do. But by having organized programs and, and ministries with specified purposes, which we try to do and have. By having consistent attendance of people who, who are regularly there in attendance and who regularly participate in, in the services and activities of the church. Now, all those things are things that send out a message to those who observe us about how seriously we take our covenant relationship with God. But what is even more important than all those outward things that people can observe is that each of us have made a commitment to God in our hearts and that we remain true to that commitment. All those other things mean nothing if you have not committed your life to Jesus Christ, no matter how hard you've worked or how much you've done for the church. All your hard work means nothing without that personal one-on-one -on -one commitment and a relationship to the Lord. So Haggai was reminding the people about this. Then the word of the Lord came to Haggai a fourth time on that same day. This was a movie, it might be a caption at the bottom, that says, later that same day. Verse 20 of chapter 2 says, The word of the Lord came to Haggai a second time on the 24th day of the month. Tell Zerubbabel, governor of Judah, that I will shake the heavens and the earth. I will overturn royal thrones and shatter the power of foreign kingdoms. I will overthrow chariots and their drivers. Horses and their riders will fall, each by the sword of his brother. On that day, declares the Lord Almighty, I will take you, my servant Zerubbabel, son of Shealtiel, declares the Lord. I will make you like my signet ring, for I have chosen you, declares the Lord Almighty. 
Here we have a word of anticipation. Haggai repeats what he alluded to earlier, that there's coming a day when earthly kingdoms will be overthrown and they will be replaced by a messianic kingdom. And I believe this is a direct reference to Jesus Christ because Zerubbabel, is a name is an ancestor of Christ in, in Matthew's gospel. I think when he, when he points to Zerubbabel, he's talking about Jesus. Because of what the Messiah would do when he comes, there will be no more need for earthly temples or for political considerations because Jesus will reign forever. But for now, in the meantime, the Lord chooses to work through earthly human circumstances. And that's why the building of the temple was necessary. Any temple that the people could build at this time would just be a poor imitation of the temple that Solomon built hundreds of years before and all of its glory and all of its gold. They just didn't have the material resources to do that. They were told to go up in the mountains and bring timber down so that they could just use resources from the land. But still, it was necessary to build the temple to carry out the work of the Lord so that they could teach about the atoning sacrifice of the Lamb of God. In the same way today, the church is just a poor imitation at best of what the kingdom of God is all about. But still, it is absolutely necessary to build the church, to carry out the work of the Lord. It's the way that God has given us to do that. And even though we might fail as a church in many different ways, we must keep building the church until that day that God completes that work in us. The local church is important today, just like that temple was centuries ago. And so like the ancient Jews, we need to be rebuked for the times that we procrastinate and we, we put our personal interests ahead of the work of the Lord. We too need to be encouraged to take heart and to not give up because the Lord is with us. We too need to be reminded that our church is not just for show or to go through religious rituals, but it is the expression of our commitment that we have with the living God. It's not the only way to express that commitment, but it is a major way. The church is important. It's a part of our testimony. And we also need to be exhorted to anticipate that day that Christ will come again and he will establish his throne. When we will no longer even need a poor imitation, but we'll have the real thing. As we close today, if there's anyone who would like to be part of that real thing, the part of that kingdom, you can make that decision to accept Christ as your own Savior, to be part of his body, to be part of the church that needs to be continually built up to honor his name.